Welcome back to Passion About Music Education, a channel dedicated to you, the music educator. My name is Rachel Hartman, and today we're going to talk about how we can support our beginner bands grow and develop at a quicker pace. Whatever situation you find yourself in, having a beginner band is an amazing opportunity to have a stepping stone for your students to progress. Playing an ensemble is so rewarding and so essential to the development of the rounded musician. Not just playing solos, but actually learning to develop and hear and blend. This is why if you take, for instance, the GCSE music course or the IB or the A-level music course, those ensemble skills as well as solo performance skills are still considered important. So how do we help our beginner students succeed and excel? One of the first strategies I like to use whenever introducing a new piece is to look at opportunities to sing, clap and then play. It's really difficult for our students to focus on anything other than pitch reading. They, they tend to go to pitch first rather than rhythm first, unless of course you're percussionist and you'll go to the rhythm. But on the whole, we are looking at the pitch first, getting the correct notes and then the reading. And so what we tend to find is it takes twice as long because we don't, our brain's trying to read the pitch, it's trying to read the rhythm and then apply that to our instrument as a beginner. So there's a lot of thought process, a lot of new, new ideas to really put in the brain, process, send the data information to the right part to coordinate your hands and coordinate your mouth so that you play the right note. So by simplifying it at the start, particularly for your beginner bands, um, is to sing the notes, say the notes, so they're reading the notes. So I often get them to say the letter names out first. Once they can do that, then we'll clap through the rhythm. Or you may find that you clap through the rhythm and then say the notes, but it's, either way it works perfectly well. I often get them to sing it as well so that they can hear the melodic line and it also helps if you've sung and demonstrated you've already sung and demonstrated not just the pitch but the rhythm so they've already heard the rhythm so more likely to copy it back once you've helped them establish that and this is maybe a couple of minute exercise this is not all, all rehearsal is then to play it you've taken away the thought process you've taken the difficulty of reading the notes and the rhythms two separate skills so they've already covered that, it's already here, so then it's a matter of processing it to their instrument. That actually helps the students speed up reading of music, particularly in an ensemble. I tend to not do this for the whole piece, but I tend to maybe do it at the beginning, at the beginning, at the end of the piece if necessary, and on anything that has a particularly difficult rhythm pattern. So often our students get um, tripped up by complicated rhythms because they may well have not experienced that in the you know the beginner method books, their first pieces. A lot of those beginner pieces are you know minims, crotchets, quavers. Um, semi brief so they're not really playing anything that's dotted rhythm that's syncopated but when they come to play band music you do find that, that mu that's already in those beginner pieces so anywhere that you can help from singing clapping um, and then a playing will help your students t eliminate all that challenge that they're trying to put instantly on their instrument a lot of music teachers will use scales as a great warm-up exercise even if it's not the full scale and you're just going up to five and back down to one just to help build the note range and the you know coordination and that's really fantastic but i think it's equally as important to do some rhythm reading exercises as a band i created a number of worksheets that i would give the band and we would play on a unison concert b flat you might want to harmonize it it's up to you but to really get them reading rhythm so i'd compose a four bar rhythm and then i'd give them a bar rest for counting so they're practicing counting science and also so they can catch up if they get behind and then another four bar and another four bar the sheet generally would be like four four and then the next sheet would be three four and it might be six eight depending on the you know ability range of your group but actually just focusing on reading the rhythm and playing that accurately will improve their rhythm reading of band music. I also think it's really important to share recordings of any music that you're doing in a band. So there's so much on YouTube now and with JW Pepper putting a lot of the scores um, on there so you can hear them 
which is fantastic for teachers because we can actually go and listen to a load of music and see whether it works for our ensembles before we buy it. Well, those recordings are equally as useful for our students to practice with. So don't underestimate sending the link in emails to the students with that because those conscientious students will go away and practice along with it. And those who maybe aren't so conscientious will probably listen to it. The, at least if they're listening to it, they know what the overall piece is. Because sometimes if you're playing the alto saxophone and you've been given the sort of, you know, that middle harmony part within the bad piece, you've got a lot of repetitive rhythm, sometimes even on the same note. And it's quite tricky to know what your part sounds like because you don't know how it fits in context but then playing your part along with the rest of the band with the flutes and maybe we've got the tune and it goes over the trumpets really does help your saxophone players for instance grow in confidence because they'll know how to fit their harmony part within the rest of the ensemble and blend well. Never be afraid to share the parts with your instrumental teachers so that it can help your students if you have a, you know, instrumental teachers come into the building. If you're not lucky enough to have that and they, your students go out and have lessons out in the community, again, try to build a network so at least you can maybe even send a recording to the teacher and say, hey, we're learning this piece at the moment. If you have a spare five minutes, if you could help my free clarinet players who have lessons with you, that would be awesome. It also you know, helps keep building links with your teachers so they know what the students are doing and the challenges so they can be supportive and also explain it. So for instance, I've got a student who's learning saxophone. He comes to me and goes, oh, we're learning this brand new piece in band. And although the teacher hadn't come to me and said, hey, could you go through it? I did then play the recording to the student and then I, we broke it down into the rhythm so this part you're playing the rhythm with the trumpet this part you're playing just this rhythm on its own and hey watch out for the rest here and the counting and we picked out the challenging parts that will trip him up playing it if he's not careful because if you don't count those parts you get out of time with the rest of the band so you know don't be afraid to reach out to the instrumental teachers because they will really want to help their students be successful. Encourage your students to obviously have a pencil in band and to have it in their case and to notate on their scores where necessary. You know, those key points, whether it's where to breathe, whether it's the dynamics, any difficult fingering, particularly valves, uh, for those flat keys um, so that they don't forget to play a G sharp or a A flat instead of a G. Um, I try not to write all that, all that in for them and I try to avoid them writing all the letters in. And you will find some students who want that, you know, for their support, for the sort of confidence. If that's the case, encourage them to only write the first letter. So if they have a row of A's, only write the first A. So then they are forced to keep reading the rest of the bar so they can only write the first time that they get a note. That, that will help them stop them writing out every single note. If you're running a beginner band and you pick pop music, which the students love to play, be careful that you're picking pop music that doesn't have really complicated rhythms or that doesn't sound like the original because they've simplified the rhythms and then the students you know, don't really like it. But some of the pop music um, tends to not relate, tends to not transfer so well in rhythmic playing for your students. So beware of that with a beginner band. Sometimes the traditional music for, you know, concert band or a jazz band actually works better because it's been written more within that context of that ability level, you know. So if you're, you've got a beginner band and you're doing, you know, the grade one level band music, the composer tends to think more about, you know, writing it in a Dorian key so it's a simplified melodic line and they keep the rhythm simple. So be careful that sometimes what you think is going to be appealing to students, and I've done this myself, I've picked some great pop tunes and then we've gone to play it, and they've been stumbling over the rhythms because actually when you look at the rhythm pots, they're very complicated. So just keep a balance of, you know, keeping students happy because you're doing the latest pop or the latest Disney to actually, is it musically right for them at this moment? Or would something a little bit more traditional that maybe they don't know 
be better for them, but they'll actually grow to love it because they can play it. One other activity I quite like to do with beginner band is switch seats. So if you've got lots of beginner students playing and you know, you've got your row of trumpets or your row of clarinets, they tend to rely on each other. They tend to wait for each other to come in. And that, you know, sometimes they're lacking confidence because they're not counting or they're, you know, they're not listening to whether they're blending or they're, you know, are they too loud compared to the rest of the band. So I quite like to do an activity which is called switching seats. So they have to go and pick up their part and pick up their instrument and go and sit somewhere else in the band. They're not allowed to sit next to the person they normally sit down next to. And first of all, it gets them to hear, like maybe if you're the trumpet player, what the flute player is playing, but it also gets them to sit in different parts of the band space so that they actually hear what it sounds like from the front, from the middle, from the side, from the back. That's a really great exercise. Kids love doing that. And don't be afraid to switch it a couple of times, um, particularly as you're coming up towards concert. It really gets them to focus on their part, to know when they need to count and concentrate and look at you as the conductor and get their head out of the school, but also to really be listening to all the other parts and how they blend. And I still think this is really important. So this is my final piece of advice. However much we want to divide our band into maybe beginner, intermediate, advanced, because we want to stretch all of those and students at the different levels, it's really helpful as a beginner to work with somebody more advanced. You know, I go and play pickleball and I'm a beginner at it and had the advanced players and the intermediate players not played or, you know, encouraged me to come and play and sort of shared their, you know, support and, hey, you're doing really well and, you are oh, you playing that shot really good and if you think about this, I definitely wouldn't have improved and I probably would have quit because I just wouldn't have had that sort of somebody to look up to but to know where I was aiming to go to. And I think it's really important, particularly with secondary school students, that they know who their role models are, who they're trying to aspire to be like. And it's not, they don't want an adult, they want a, another student to you know, go, oh, when I'm in year nine, I want to be like so-and-so, I want to be able to play like them, I want to be as good as them. And it's that inspiration. And so if you can, try to encourage your older students to still come and help out in the beginner band. Whether they come and you can give them credit for um, a community service or whatever way that you can praise. They become a section leader, they become a you know, band coach. Whatever it is that you can do to reward those older students, the benefit of them playing, the security they will give the beginners will be invaluable, but it also help your beginners grow in confidence and improve quicker. So look for opportunities where you can use the strength of your more advanced players to help and support the program at the bottom end so it keeps growing up through the school. It's sort of important for every level that you can do that. I do hope these tips are helpful and I'd love to know what your favourite tip is to help your uh, beginner intermediate bands grow and develop in confidence and skill. Love you to share it in the feed at the bottom in the comments. We are a community of passionate musicians and educators so we should be sharing and, and helping each other grow and helping our students grow. Um, if you've enjoyed this video and found it helpful, please like and subscribe, share it with colleagues. If there's any other topics, again, leave them in the comments or reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to make videos on that. And I look forward to seeing you again here very soon on Passionate About Music Education.